Hello and welcome to In the Shadows, a bi-weekly podcast that shares paranormal stories from the southern states and beyond. I'm your host, Noelle, and I'll be taking you on this guided tour into the dark and creepy. From creaking footsteps and odd shadows to unsettling buildings and strange lights, each episode will have two strange tales of the unknown, but only one of them will have really happened. Each true account that is shared here is a personal tale that I've either experienced firsthand or has been shared with me by friends and family members. All names and locations have been changed to protect the information of everyone involved. Do you have a story you'd like to share? Send an email to podcastintheshadows at gmail.com or join our Facebook group in the Shadows Podcast to share your own tales of the supernatural. All personal stories pictures and videos are welcome and may be chosen with permission for an episode. Now sit back, pull your blankets close, hold tight to your flashlight, and let's begin. Welcome back for more frights and delights. First we'll discuss episode one. There's something strange about cemeteries. I brought you two different stories one called Green Eyes and the other Leave Now. The story Green Eyes was actually something my brother told me ages ago when my overactive imagination had me terrified of the ideas of going into a certain graveyard. I've driven by that graveyard in particular and I've never seen the green eyes myself. He swears they're still out there though. The second story, Leave Now actually happened to me. I visited two different graveyards with friends investigating and we got rather interesting results. They were also terrifying results and I would never suggest going to a graveyard at night without permission and safety. Needless to say, I have not gone back to either graveyard, mostly because the second one where we saw the shadow figures and something did slam into the trunk of my vehicle left me so unnerved that I never wanted to go back. Now, make sure that you've wrapped yourself up tight. It's time for us to go on a journey into the old Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia. This next episode is titled, There's Dangerous Things in These Mountains. The Guardian My parents divorced when I was eight years old. My father quickly remarried and had two other children with his new wife, while my mother eventually married a man who had two children of his own, and since all of my siblings chose to live with my mother, we had a household of ten altogether. Things sometimes got cramped there, but we loved each other dearly. My father wasn't around very often when I was younger, But as my older brother and I got older, he would randomly appear, sometimes to treat us with ice cream or a movie. And as my younger siblings got older, he began inviting them along on sporadic and brief outings. We rarely saw him, but we tried to make the best of the times that we did spend with him. It was late May, and a few weeks after my 15th birthday that my father chose to invite my siblings and me out for a movie and a burger. Most of my younger siblings chose to attend a nearby revival with my mother and stepfather, while the other four of us, the older ones, went along with my dad. It was shortly into the movie that he got up to get a snack and never returned. Later we would find out that he had a new girlfriend outside of his new wife, and he'd loved us to fend for ourselves. Luckily, we only lived maybe 10 miles away from the theater, but it was late evening already going dark, and the woods of West Virginia can be terrifying. This was decades before cell phones were even thought of, and we had no way to get hold of our mother since she was at the revival with other family members at the old church that was over 20 miles away. It was my older brother who bravely said, as long as we stick together, we'll be okay. There's still enough sun out. We just need to walk fast to make it home before the sun has gone down. We were all scared of the dark, 
but he led the way nonetheless, saying that we would catch a ride with someone if they stopped. We stuck to the roads with only the lowering sun to light the way along the winding mountains. The last few miles were in total darkness, aside from the moon, and we clung tight to each other's hands. We walked in the middle of the road, and luckily for us, nobody came along or we would have been struck. The wind was biting, and the sound of animals in the forest made us jump. We couldn't know if it was a rabbit, or if it was something more sinister, like a wolf that was in the bushes nearby. All we could do to keep ourselves calm was sing random songs nervously and pray the whole way home. Once on the long, dirt driveway to our home, we began to run, no longer caring about anything outside of getting inside that protective space and waiting for Mom to finally come home with our siblings. We had a rectangular wooden porch on the front, eight feet long by ten feet wide, with a key hidden under a brick we kept on the side of the house. We stomped our shoes clean of dirt, hurried inside, and locked the door behind us. My younger siblings curled up on the couch with the idea of warming up after the miserable walk while my brother and I took seats near the door to discuss our anger with our father. It was my brother who heard the footsteps first. They had come up the wooden stairs onto the porch, moved to the left to follow the rectangular shape of the porch, past the door, and along the other side of it to the steps. My brother sharply whispered for all of us to be quiet and listened as the steps again moved, along the rectangular path with slow, steady steps. By now, all of us had gone quiet, our ears pricked as we listened to those footsteps. My brother glanced out the front window quickly, pulling the curtain back, hoping to see who was walking along that porch without being seen. But as soon as he pulled the curtain back, he quickly pushed it back into place and held it there by hand. Patty! Come look, he told me, and I unwillingly leaned forward as he pulled the curtain away. In the weak yellow light coming in from the fort porch, I could see his pale face, and as I glanced out the window, I saw nothing. There's no one there, he told me quietly. I didn't want to believe him. I didn't want to believe what I was seeing. Somewhere in the back of my terror-stricken mind, I still wanted to believe that a friend had somehow seen us, had decided that this was the perfect time to frighten us, knowing that our parents were all gone to the church. But my eyes made me believe what my brain refused to. I nudged my brother aside to glance out the window again and listen as the footsteps came by the door. I could feel the shudder of vibration through my foot as I listened to them get close to us and then pass by. My younger brother and sister were obviously frightened now, and I quickly comforted them in the best way I knew how to. I brought them blankets and promised they were safe, giving them both a hug and telling them to be quiet, to pray, to just pray to God and know that we were safe, that our older brother was there and he would help protect us. While I sat with them, hugging them there on the couch, he continued to stare out the window as tears began to trail down his cheeks. To see my older brother crying in fear had such a strong effect on me, and I wanted nothing more than to hug him close to me as I had the others. We sat there, well over an hour listening to those footsteps continue their march along the porch, go down the stairs then come back up again in that same rectangular path. They came back toward the door, slowed, then stopped. During that time, none of us would say a thing. We waited for something, for a knock, for something to start rattling the door. Instead, what we heard were voices. Our mom, stepfather, and the rest of the kids had finally come home. My brother immediately grabbed for the door, and he rushed out the door to tell my mother the full story of what had transpired through the night. She was quick to check on us, more concerned by us being abandoned by our father than by ghostly footsteps. At first we could tell she didn't believe us, but as adamant as we all were over the days, 
She was reluctant to agree that, yes, maybe we had heard something outside. But she never fully believed the idea that something had watched over us through the night. Years later, however, she did tell me that she'd been praying for her safety while they were at the revival. Something just told her that we would be in danger otherwise, and she prayed fervently for our safety. I now believe that the footsteps we heard was a guardian angel that was sent by my mother's prayers. The Boy in Blue My cousins and I often visited our Aunt Judith and Uncle Don during the summertime. Their house sits on a hill with a large barn nearby and a pond about a quarter of a mile away, just on the other side of a hill. We loved taking swims in that pond when we were younger, even though my aunt and uncle would warn us about snakes and how deep the water was. The snakes mostly left us alone, and the depths never really bothered us since we were decent swimmers at a young age. Once school was out for summertime, we would immediately be over at their house. We would take Aunt Judith's favorite wicker picnic basket and we would fill it to the brim with sandwiches, slices of cake, jars of pickles and other fresh fruit and vegetables, jugs of sweet tea, and we would get it so heavy that we would have to take turns lugging the basket two at a time over to the pond. There was a flat rock over there about 12 feet wide, that jutted over the water's edge. It had become our official picnic table. The basket would get parked on the rock and we'd hop into the water immediately, hooting and hollering and swimming laps across the 15-yard wide pond. We knew of the dangerous spots. On the west side of the pond was an old oak tree that hung over the water. It had a dangerous drop with tangles of roots that could grab hold of you tight before you realized what was happening and drown you quick. On the other side was a cluster of pond weed that got so thick you couldn't trudge through it. Mostly we kids kept to the rock on the southern area, closer to the house. Even though our aunt couldn't see us from the porch, she and Uncle Don would wander up to the widow's walk on the roof, glance over our way from time to time to make sure we were fine, and then they would head back in. Other times, they might wander down to watch over us and even dip their own feet into the water. Or Uncle Don would bring down his fishing poles, bring some fresh worms, and we would make a day of it, fishing up whatever we could find. This became a main part of our childhood. We would often head out early in the day, usually around nine, then head back in around seven just when the sun was starting to set in the distance. As it was, one time, we'd stayed later than what we'd meant to. The light was fading on us, and we'd spent the whole day running around the pond, climbing up along the old oak tree on dares, or running races through the nearby fields that were part of my aunt's property. Our aunt hadn't bothered to check on us in quite some time that day, and no one else had thought to call us in, so we thought we'd been the one rule our aunt had given us. Once the sun goes down, the kids are inside. It seemed none of the adults were bothered with us, so why should we worry? My cousins and I decided we'd get in just one more race, that's all. The seven of us would line up at the tree, and at my eldest cousin's yell, we were off. The track we took was about 50 yards long, where the grass had been beaten down by years of our trampling children's feet. The track veered around a cluster of rocks and cacti, then around an old, small farmhouse that had slowly been falling apart for over a century. It would then arc back toward the left into a small gathering of trees, mostly old fruit trees that my aunt and grandmother couldn't be bothered with. We'd slow down here to make sure our feet didn't stomp down on any old, mushy fruit, though we often did. And then we'd curve back toward the old oak tree, follow along the pond's edge, and the first one to jump from the rock and into the water would be declared the winner. We had run this path well over a hundred times, but never so late. So maybe that's why my little cousin Tommy stumbled over one of the rocks when we came to the first turn. Just as we made that arc, down he went with a yell, then a cry of pain. His foot had struck the rock hard enough that his ankle had twisted on him. 
As we gathered around him, we fretted about how we were going to carry him home, and, worse, what if he had broken something? It was decided that Rhonda, the fastest of us, would head back and tell Aunt Judith what had happened. The rest of us would find a way to hoist him up on our shoulders and carry him back home. My older cousin David had knelt to fill around on the ankle just to see if it was broken, but Tommy distracted him by pointing at the rock and saying, I think that's a gravestone. The area was clustered up with weeds that we began to pull at and then swipe at the dirt that had filmed over the rock. We were able to make out the words, Here lies young Joseph Abbott, age 12, gone too soon. And below that, 1854 to 1866. The rest of us set immediately to cleaning out the other rocks as best as we could, trying to be mindful of the cacti that grew erratically around the stones. Not all of them were easy to read. They were aged, and the years had worn the words away. But we found one that read, Grace Abbott, Dear Daughter, 1863 to 1865. A solemn gloom settled over us, we young children. We didn't understand mortality, not yet, so we didn't know how to respond to it. Finally, David said, well, never mind that. I'm sure Aunt Judith is going to be up here soon, and she's going to be so angry with us. He helped direct us to pick up Tommy. Two grabbed his legs, and two were at his arms while David led the way. We were most of the way home when Aunt Judith came tearing up the hill, angry, upset with us. Didn't I tell you kids to come home when it got dark? Didn't I tell you it's dangerous running around that path? She was swatting her kitchen towel at the air in lieu of swatting us, but the effect was still the same. The sting wasn't physical, but we could feel the sting of shame and guilt. We helped carry Tommy in and settled him on the couch so Aunt Judith could tend to his injuries. Luckily, there was no break, but that didn't stop her from chastising us for our carelessness. When she'd calmed down finally, she asked how the injury had happened, and I explained, He fell over one of the rocks by those cacti, but did you know that's a graveyard out there, Aunt Judith? She didn't answer me. She got quiet and there was a funny expression on her face for a good while. She went from a plum red to near white, and she told us, I don't want you children ever going near that area again. It's dangerous. You could have really hurt yourselves, and there's no telling what's out there. We all agreed, reluctant, and when Uncle Don got home later that night, he was filled in on the injury and how Tommy had fallen over the stones that happened to be part of a graveyard. Oh, yeah, I know where you're talking about. That would be the old Abbott plot. There's some of our kin out there. You know that old farmhouse that you kids like to run around? Well, that used to belong to them, but the kids died of fever pretty young, and their mom, Peggy, she killed herself. Their dad, Samuel, was all fighting in the war when this happened, the war between the states. He didn't find out about his wife and kids passing until he came home, and when he did, he went crazy. They ended up taking him to a special hospital, and they say he died there, but no one knows where he was buried. It was obvious he meant to say more, but Aunt Judith shushed him and told him, Do you want to give the kids nightmares? We all had questions, and we were eager to ask them to find out more. But Uncle Don could see that Aunt Judith was deeply upset, and they both refused to give us any further information. It was getting pretty late anyway, nearly ten, and Uncle Don said that we should be heading on to bed. It was agreed upon that we would just stay the night. We called her parents, let them know, and then started to wash up for bed. That was around the time that Aunt Judith asked us, what did you do with my wicker basket? We realized in our excitement to get Tommy back that we had forgotten the basket by the pond, and it was up to David and me to retrieve it. Aunt Judith gave us a flashlight and she admonished us, you get that basket and you get back here quick. It's late and there could be wild animals and who knows what else out there. 
For all I know, there are snakes and ants and who knows what else in that basket. She was still fretting at us when we left the house. The evening sky was bright enough that we could see our well-beaten path, but as soon as we stepped out, there was a decided tension. This uneasy feeling that something was indeed out there. We reached for each other's hands. David flashed the light back and forth across the path and asked me, Is it just me or do you feel like something's watching us? I didn't want to admit that I felt it also. So instead I told him, Let's just run there. We tried not to outpace each other as we hurried along the path, stumbling over the uneven ground and random roots. It didn't take very long to get back to the pond. And there sat the basket on the rock, just waiting for us. David reached for the handle, and as he did, there was a whisper. Hey, what are you doing out here? David frantically jerked the flashlight around, and it landed on a boy dressed in blue. He was standing in the deep grass near our running track, watching us and moving. I took in his dark clothes, his dark hair, and then his dark eyes, so unbearably dark. It took more than a second for me to realize that it wasn't that they were dark. It was that they were hollow pits of blackness. David screamed, which caused me to jump, and my hand jerked free of his. Now that he was no longer holding my hand, he was able to grab the basket in both of his arms and run at a frantic speed back toward the house, leaving me behind. I dashed after him in terror, but since I didn't have a flashlight, I had a much more difficult time. I kept falling repeatedly, bashing my knees and legs, bruising my arms and elbows. I had this wild fear that the boy was right behind me, chasing me, and soon I would feel his cold dead hands on my back pulling at me. It stayed on the forefront of my mind the whole way back to the house. By the time I reached the porch, I was half mad with tears. Aunt Judith was there at the screen door, and she quickly opened it, demanding to know what happened. We couldn't say anything, We simply shook and cried, and she led us into the kitchen to give us each a glass of water. She then sat us down to doctor us with mercurochrome, and again asked us what happened. We explained as best as we could. There was a boy by the pond, but his eyes, his eyes, they they were black. No, it wasn't that they were black. It was, it was, they weren't there. And he just stood there by the pond, just staring at us. Uncle Don had come into the kitchen to check on us as well and was laughing at our shaky explanation. You kids and your overactive imaginations. Seems like you spooked yourselves out and you probably saw a bush or something. You could tell by the troubled look on Aunt Judith's face that she didn't think so. I don't want you kids ever going back out that way near that farmhouse, she told us sharply, enough so that even Uncle Don was taken back by surprise at her tone. She was never sharp with us kids. I don't know what you saw out there. I don't think I want to know. But those stones and that house are dangerous, and you don't need to be out there. And if I hear or see that any of you kids went running down that path again, I will come out there and I will whip your rears off. We sat there in stunned silence. Aunt Judith had never once whipped us. She'd never even threatened to whip us before, no matter how much trouble we'd gotten into. She was the favorite of the family because she was such a mild woman. Uncle Don told us, go to bed now. We'll talk in the morning. David and I hurried off to bed. We didn't say a word to each other as we went to the room that all of us cousins were sharing together. As we shut the door behind us, the rest of the cousins, who were still awake, looked up at us and asked what had happened. But we shook our heads, climbed into the bed, and waited. Each time one of the cousins would ask, What happened again? We would merely shush them and say, wait. 
A few minutes later, we could hear the soft, creaking footsteps of Aunt Judith and Uncle Don coming along the hallway. They stayed there at the door for almost a minute, then with the same soft footsteps, walked to their own room. We all sat there in that quiet darkness, waiting, and then David told them about the strange boy with the dark eyes, who was dressed all in blue. Rhonda, who was usually the quiet one, told us, Oh, that's Joey. That's the boy who died out there at the farmhouse. Daddy's seen him too. We don't like him. He makes us feel scared. Stiltingly, Rhonda explained that when she and her parents would sometimes go along that path over to their house at late at night, that sometimes they would see the boy there, either at the farmhouse, or over in the trees, or merely watching them. Daddy told me never go over there late at night. He said that he gets a bad feeling about that boy. Daddy's the one that told me his name is Joey because he used to talk to him once upon a time. And Joey would tell him to do bad things. We each had the same thought. Joey. Joey, could that possibly be Joseph Abbott? Could that possibly be the same owner of that stone that we had seen earlier? Whenever my cousin had fallen over the rock, had that somehow woken Joseph up? Or had he always been there watching us and we never realized it? We might have discussed it more, but we heard the footsteps of my Aunt Judith again coming along the hallway. So we didn't bother. And the next morning, whenever she had a sit-down talk with us, we all readily agreed that we would not go near that path. And I'd like to say that we kept that promise, but we were dumb children, all of us. There were times that we would get that unsettling feeling any time that we were near the farmhouse, like we were being watched. But we made sure to never be around the pond after dark after that. It was an unspoken agreement that we all shared. As soon as we noticed the sun was going down, we were quick to gather our things and we would leave. I'd also like to say that I never saw Joey again after that, but that would be a lie. However, that's a story for another time. Thank you so much for joining me for the second episode of In the Shadows. I look forward to bringing you episode 3 when we'll discuss which story is the real one this time. There were a few telltale signs, but they weren't obvious. I'm also excited to tell you of a friend's podcast that will be coming in the future, Beyond the Campfire Light. He too is a lover of spooky tales and is a phenomenal storyteller. Whenever his episode's released, I will be glad to link it, and I'm excited for everybody to go visit and listen to him. In the meantime, my lovely people, good night, sleep tight, and don't let the ghouls bite.